Okay, welcome to our level five, five, level five, SCQF mock theory test walkthrough. So we're going to walk through all the answers on this test. Okay, so question one, and we've got an hour to do this, but I'm going to do this in less than an hour, hopefully. Explain the purpose of a ledger line. So a ledger line, and in question two, we've got a wee bit where it's asking for an example. That's a bit of a giveaway, kind to a degree. Because if you remember, our ledger line is going to be either there or there. It's going to be either above or below the staff to extend its range. And that's your answer there. Okay. So, what is a ledger line? You could say a ledger line is. You could say what it is. I'm just going to say a short... Additional line above or below the stave to extend its range. Done. Easy peasy. On the stave below, draw an example of a ledger line. So you could have one of several examples, okay? So you could have something above, all right? I mean, the, the usual thing to do is draw a note above and do a line through it like that. You wouldn't be wrong to have, um, if I rub it out, you're gonna be quite fancy doing this but you wouldn't be wrong having the line and the note above it. That's not wrong. All right. Same same way as if you had line below and either the note there or potentially the note there. You're not wrong with any of them. Okay, but the standard thing that we usually, or I usually certainly see, is folk drawing the line or the ledger line and then putting the note on it like that. That's far from wrong. It's actually very, very good. Question two. On the space below, draw out the great staff. You must include three clefts and middle C, the pitch of the bass and tenor drawn in drums and the bagpipe scale. So it's asking for quite a lot there. So let's start with drawing the great staff first. So I always say, take questions like this one stage at a time. So let's draw the great staff first. So we'll do our, our lines, there's one, two, three, four, and bear with me because I'm using an iPad and an Apple Pencil here. Okay, and what I usually do for um, it's asking for middle C and the three clefts, okay? So I do the, the third clef sign below, and I'll show you what I mean, okay? So let's do our other five lines. Make sure you leave a space in the middle, because that's where our middle C is going to go. I'll try and make this as neat as I can. Oh, I've just mucked up there. A wee touch, that's a wee bit scruffy, but it's okay. Oh, that last line's rubbish. Boop. Let's do that one again. There we are. And the beautiful thing about this is I can zoom in and tidy up these edges. You likely can't zoom in. All right, but you would just try and make them as pretty as you can. Pretty. Oh, that just looks stinking. Rubber. Boop. Oh, no, my God. Oh, no. Ah, looks a bit ski with. Let's see if I can make that a bit better. Let's zoom in. All right, I've got time. Time is on my side, I think. It's better. That one's kind of better. That's just going to do. <laughs> right, let's fix this. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come on. Oh, come on. Stay still. Right, so we've done the first part, the great staff. Let's draw middle C. Close we're here. So remember, we'll just do a little C there. So that's our middle C. Uh, three clefts, so let's draw the treble clef first, and remember it goes over here. And remember, when we're drawing the treble clef, we always start on G. And we should by now know, remember that G is the second line on that staff. So I always start with a dot, and I'll bring the line circle up, down underneath. Round, down, and finish with a wee dot there again. That's my treble clef. Done. And I'll do the bass clef after I've done the bagpipe scale, because you should tackle each one one at a time, all right? But unlike with this one, I'm working from the top, so I know the bagpipe scale is going to go in here. Okay, so we should also remember that the bagpipe, bagpipe scale starts on G, which is this position here. So we've got G, A, B, C, and they're just going up one at a time. G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then you've got a wee ledger line for high A. And then if we get the ruler out and go underneath them and put our, put our stems on them all. And we can put the little pitch names above them as well. So that's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, I've done that wrong. Hold on. So it's G. My fault, sorry. G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and A. Okay, so you see on this chanter scale that there's two G's and two A's. Okay, which means you've got low G, high G, low A, high A which in turn tells you that in the Chanter scale there are two full octaves. Okay, and then let's just do a little bracket here. And I've seen folk on this bracket write, um, what's it called, the Chanter scale. I've heard folk write um, bagpipe scale. I've heard folk write range of the Great Highland Bagpipe. Okay, I usually just write bagpipe scale. So we'll write that here. Done. Okay, so, so far we've got middle C done. We've done uh, one of the clefts, we've done the bagpipe scale. So the next thing we'll do is let's draw the, what's it called? The bass clef. So starts on F, all right, and if you remember rightly, that's the position of F there. And I always start the bass clef with a dot on that position, and it's a fancy looking seven with two dots, either side of that position there, which is F. Okay, so we've done that clef. We're going to do the third clef sign down here, but we'll do that at the end, okay? So let's do our bass and tenor drum and drones. So we should hopefully remember that they're all tuned relative to low A. So we had F was here, G, A would be on the line. So let's draw an A or a, do a crotch it. And then we know that, what do you call it, the 
that's the tenor drone or tenor drum. The bass drone or bass drum is also A. So we need to work our way down. So we've got um, A and then G, F. In fact, let me do dots so you can see. So we've got A, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. So A is going to be in the space down there. So let's get rid of these dots. And then we would do a little arrow from there and there. And we could call these either the tenor, um, the tenor and bass drone, or you could say the tenor and bass drum. So let's say we'll go for, let's say drones first. Why not? Oh, that's my rubber. So we'll call this one tenor drone. And then we'll do a line here and say this one could be bass drone. And then all we need to do is do the same as we've done here, but do it here for the tenor drum and the tenor drone. So we know it's on low A and the A again. So there's the tenor drone and it's honestly the exact same. And then on the space, the tenor drum. So let's go for bass drum first. And then this one will bring it down and it'll be tenor drum. Done. So let's zoom out again. And we've got middle C, pitch of the bass and tenor drones and drums, bagpipe scale. All we need to do is get the third clef sign there. So let's do it down at the bottom. As I said before, I like to just draw it on the bottom. So all I'll do is five lines again. One, two, three, and it's hard for me to see where the end is, so I'm gonna tidy it up in a wee bit. Three, four, five. So I'll zoom in and I'll tidy this up. And this one looks not too bad. Okay, so there's C. So that C is the exact same spot as that C. Okay, exact same. Now all we need to do is draw the uh, auto cliff. So I like making that line thicker and then a thin line. I'll do a dot on the top, middle and bottom. And from each dot, I'm going out and making an artsy bee, just like that. And that's me drawing the tenor clef. So we've got treble clef, bass clef, and alto clef. All three of them done. So with this question, you've got 12 marks. So you'll get a lot of marks for content, like clearly making sure that you put everything in that you need to put in on it but you'll also get marks for neatness so if your writing is really scruffy you're gonna lose marks guaranteed right let's push on right so we're writing monotones now so i need to move the screen hopefully this works for you i'll put it down again hopefully it works so it's asking for Using the time signatures provided, write four bars of a monotone rhythm. No two bars should have the same note groupings, even written in a different order. So you can't have, if I write very quickly, you can't have crotch it, crotch it, two quavers. This is me just scribbling. Then you couldn't have crotch it, two quavers, crotch it. You couldn't do that. 
Okay, so you need to mix it up a little bit. And by level five, we should be pretty good at mixing up, I would say. So let's go to the start of the three, four. Got a double bar line at the end, so we're going to do our double bar line at the start. Okay, and usually when I write out monotones like this, I always start with the first beats and or the first bar just being the beat note. I always start with that. So I'm not going to change. I'll be crotch it, crotch it, crotch it, like that. And then at this point, when you come into here, it's a three four, so you've got one, two, three beats. They all need to add up to the value of a crotch it. Okay, it's up to you how you go about it. Okay, because I don't want this video to take forever, I'm going to quiz through it. I'm going to take that crotch it and put it here, but I'm going to split it in half. So I've got two quavers. Like that. And then I'll maybe take these two quavers, put them in here, but split them in half again. So I get four semis. One, two, three, four. And then I'm going to do a crotchet here, because I can. So that's one, two, three. Three beats. Done. So that's me done two bars. Moving on to the third bar. You can mess about with triplets and things if you want. Okay, so I'm going to put a triplet in here. Triplet. And remember when you're counting triplets, it's three in the time of two. So there are, and I'll write scruffily or quickly, you've got one, two, three quavers, which do not equal a crotchet, they equal a dotted crotchet. However, when you're counting um, those groups at three groups of notes, because it's got a triplet sign on it, you only count two of them. So you're still playing three of them, but you're only counting two of them. And that gives you the value for the beat note. And we'll write out another triplet. Da, 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 da. Cause we can. And then to finish it off, we've still got space. We're gonna take everything we've done so far and we're gonna tinker about with it. Okay, so let's take those four semis. Right, and we'll change the first two into a quaver. So it'll be a quaver here, and then two semis. So there's my quaver, and two semis. And you might think, well, how did you do that? Well, all I've done was take those two, add it up to a quaver, and then those two, when added up, equal a quaver anyway. So when I add them up together, I get my crotch it. That is how that works. Okay, and if you're comfortable with that, you can mess about. You've got four almost possibilities of messing about with that. Okay, so I'm going to take, instead of adding these two to make a quaver, I'm going to make these two a quaver instead and put it in here. So I've got almost the exact opposite of this. So it'll be semi, semi, and then a single quaver. And then we've not done any rests, so I'm going to put in a crotch at rest and then a single crotch at note. And that would be me done, that line of three, four. And you don't have to play what you've wrote, but if I was asked, I would play it would be one, two, three, one and two a and a three, one a day, two a day, three, and a one a and miss three. That's what I've wrote. Funky, okay? Right, let's move on to the nine eight. So with nine eights, 
it's three beats per bar. Okay, because we're in compound time, we take the top number, divide it by three, it tells you how many beats are in the bar, so it's three. Nine divided by three is three. Or you could say, right, well, what's nine eight? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine eighth notes, which is all of this. That's what the time signature is physically telling us. Okay, and you know that in compound time, the beat note is divisible by three and dotted. So those two quavers equal the crotch it. There's my dot from the third quaver. Those two quavers equal a crotch it. That quaver's my dot. Those two quavers equal a crotch it. And that's my dot. So I know everything in a bar of 9-8 has to add up to three dotted crotchets. And same as I've done before, I'm going to start with that. Just like above. Okay, so I'll zoom in a little bit and make it easier for me to draw this. Dotted crotchet 1. Dotted crotchet 2. Dotted crotchet number 3. So I've got one, two, three. There's my three beats in the bar. And we could take the dotted crotchet and dissect it down a little bit. So remember, we just drew it below. If we split a dotted crotchet up into equal parts, it would be three quavers. Like that. Okay, and then if I take this is me just going off the cuff. If I take that crotch it, put it in here, and we said the value of the dot was a quaver, so I could put that in here. And then I'm going to do the same again. Crotch it, quaver, crotch it, quaver to get that da, 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 da ribbon. And then we could put a crotch at rest in, and again, I'm just going off the cuff. You could do whatever you want. Now we're gonna take, uh, let's take these two and put them in here, but instead of crotch at quaver, we'll go quaver crotch it, because you can. So let's do our quaver first. Quaver crotch it, and then we'll put a dotted crotch it in to calm it down just so it doesn't sound too crazy. And then to finish it, we'll take these three quavers and we'll mess about with them. So let's do a rest on the first one. So rest, quaver, quaver, because that still equals our beat notes, it's three quavers. And then let's go, what will we do, what will we do? We'll we make a rest on the middle one. So it'll be quaver, no, quaver, no, quaver. And then let's do two quavers and then a quaver rest. So we're showing you the possibility, or I'm showing you the possible things that you could do with. That. And that's quite awkward to play again. Miss uh, day one, day miss, uh, it's, it's quite awkward. But I suppose for the, the in terms of practice and music writing, it's giving you a picture of what you could do, which is quite cool. So that's me done the monotones. And you could do whatever you want for these, okay? As long as it adds up three crotchets per bar or three dotted crotchets. And again, on your exam, it might be a 2-4. It might be a 4-4 four four that you're getting asked to do. In the same token, with the compound time, it could be a 6-8, it could be a 12-8. If it's a 6-8, it's 2 beats per bar. If it's a 12-8, it's 4 beats per bar. And it could be any one of those that you're asked to do. Now, what are we getting asked for? On the stay below, write out first 8 bars of a 6-8 from memory. So, uh, let's see... Afro Highlanders. Okay, and you can write out like a busker 6-8 for this if you want. 
Okay, so you need to go straight in for the time signature. Although, let's make that a bit neater, it looks a bit scruffy. Because you will get marked for neatness on this. Let's make it look pretty. And does it say that it needs to be repeated? Repeat marks were necessary. Okay, so let's... You've got the double bar line there. All right, let's get rid of this because I'm just going to start with a flam because why not? We'll go flam, seven stroke roll, seven stroke roll, right left flam. So we'll write that six eight, which is da da da. Crotchet quaver, crotchet quaver. Oh. Crotchet, quaver, crotchet, quaver. It's my flam. Does up. And then I'm rolling through to here. Does up. Right, left. Flam. Left, right. So let's roll through now. Do our quavers. Dot cut. Dot cut. Flam. Zoom out. Looks good. And then we're into the middle. So left flam. Right left. And it's the exact same rhythm as these, so I can just copy that. But it's opposite hands. And then it's a 13, which is the value of a full beat note. I'll oh, finish the flam. So it's a dotted crotchet. And then finish the 13. Left, right, flam. And then our tap to get back into it. Dot, dot. Finish the flam. Lovely. And then this bar is going to be the same as that. And this bar will be the same as that. If you want, you could mix it up. I might mix it up just for the banter. All right, but you wouldn't need to mix it up. So, flam, seven stroke roll, seven stroke, zoom out a little bit, tap, to zap. And I'm going to just tinker a touch to zap. So I'll keep this the same. All I'm going to do is just do a crotch a quaver here. Just to be different. And then your ending would normally be, be flam 5, 13, left, right, flam. But we'll do it slightly different. We'll do the flam 5 as normal. We'll go flam does up. Which is the same rhythm as above. And then we'll do five stroke roll. We'll do this da 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 rhythm, but we'll go dis da dis da. So it'll be five stroke roll first. And then left. So it's the exact same note values. And then this is going to be a left to right roll. And it'll be da 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 da, which is theoretically a group of three. Bit split in half, so that's the first two. Oh, 
first two split in half. Next one, or the first note, sorry, that's your first quaver split in half. I'll draw it above so you can see what I mean. And we'll roll over. And we'll finish with a crotch. And we'll put the quaver in as well. So we can play that on the repeat. Do our repeat marks. I'm going to move here so I don't press done and it stops recording. Okay, so as I was saying there, these two are a quaver, those two are a quaver, and that's a quaver as it is. So we know that those three added up equal the value of the beat note that we're after. Okay. So that works. So let's add some embellishment, not embellishments, let's add some flurry to it. So we'll put an accent there. We'll put an accent there. Let's put a crescendo on this 13. We'll not accent this flam. All right. Oh, my crescendo line disappeared. And we'll put an accent on this one. And we'll accent this. And we'll accent that. And that's it done. Okay, and same again, you've got 16 marks here, so you'll be getting a lot of marks for what you've wrote, but you'll also be getting a lot of marks for neatness. Okay, so take your time with it, as long as you've got time. And the last question in terms of music writing, write out four bars of a reel from memory. So this theory paper has asked for a reel. Bear in mind, for this level of qualification, it's going to be a march just being reel that you need to play. All right, so... Try and make sure whatever you're writing, um, whatever you're writing, that you've got, what's it called? Um, that it's what you're going to play for the practical exam. Make sure that's what you're going to play. All right, so for the Preston Lodge folk, you'd be playing your juvenile MSR. And for this year, our juvenile MSR is Lieutenant Colonel. DJS Murray. Okay. And you would write it out on here. Okay, so a reel is in 2 2. And I'm not going to explain what I'm writing as I'm writing it. I'm just going to write out our first bar of DJS Murray. Alright, and you would write out at this point whatever reel you're going to play for your exam. If you're a PLer and you're watching this, then I would suggest you copy out what I'm doing and pause it as and when you need to and get used to writing this out. I'll try to remember it. Tap rough brat da. And this is the way I usually write out music. I'll usually do a group at a time and I'll make sure the stems and the stave all match. Tap da ra. Da, dot, cut, and then I go back and finish it off. It's almost like crossing the eyes and crossing the eyes, dotting the eyes and crossing the t's. All right, so that's my first two bars, and then I'm going to finish it off. I'm pretty sure it's a triplet in here. Hopefully I'm writing this correct. It's been a wee while since I played this tune. Where's my stem? There we are. Stem.
And I've just realised a wee mistake I've made. Let's get my little rubber out. Yeah, those shouldn't be joined as I had, sorry. So that's a triplet. Accent the first, accent the last. It's a roll. Accent there. And then it's flam to flam. And then flam, flam one, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four. Let's have a look. So check to check. So I need to accent that. Check to check, and then we're accenting that and that flam. And that's it done. Underneath the first bar, write the pulse pattern. All right. So when it's where this one, if you can remember, when it's two beats per bar, the pulse pattern is strong weak if it's three beats per bar it's strong weak weak and if it's four beats per bar it's strong weak medium weak and that's the pulse pattern and if you're unsure what i mean think about what a bass drummer would do beat miss and beat miss and beat miss or strong weak strong weak three four strong weak weak strong weak Weak, four, four, strong, weak, medium, weak, strong, weak. Think about the bass drummer. Okay, they're not going to be playing that, but that's the pattern that the tune follows. All right, they might well play that. All right, you hear a lot of bass drummers will play that. Uh, pipers will say they follow a strong, weak, medium, weak pattern in stress bass. Um, I don't think they do. All right, I think of the majority of the time it's strong, weak, weak, weak when they play stress bass. But that's the official pulse pattern anyway. So underneath the first bar, write the pulse pattern. As we said, two beats per bar, it's going to be strong weak. So let's write that. So it'll be S for strong, W for weak. And it's only asked for the first bar. If it asked for all the bars, then you would do strong weak. You would do it underneath them all. It's only asked for the first bar. So we're only going to give them the first bar. Okay? And that's us done, the music writing. And as I said before, that's the real. Make sure that you're comfortable with how to write out your march and make sure you're comfortable with how to write out your stress bay. Okay? Because it's going to be one of the three that you're asked for in this exam. Right, and then last question. Let's see if we can flip it back round and get ready to answer this. So what's it asking? Drum maintenance is an essential part of playing the instrument and no less than 150 words. I've seen this question before um, and I've seen it asking for no less than 250 words before. Okay, so you've got to give whatever it's asking. All right, so this is 150. I reckon in your test it's going to be 250. Okay, so I'm not going to write out everything here. I'm going to write out bullet points for you to think of that you could elaborate on on it to get your 100 or 250 words. All right, so what's it saying? Importance of before and after. So let's deal with before. Okay, so before you play, you're going to check for damages. Okay. And this could be, like, so the top head could be damages. It could be damages to any of the metal work. So you've got, think of the drum you've, from top to bottom, checking for damages on your top head, if it's burst, your top rim, if it's cracked, suspension ring, if it's cracked, tension rods, tension bolts, the shell, is it warped, is um, the top bottom skin, is it burst, bottom snare, is it intact? 
All right, is there anything burst or snapped or anything broken that alerts you on the drum? Okay. Um, if you've got time and it's um, a reasonably new head, I suppose you could take the top head off and check for internal damages. But if you're um, about to perform at a competition, there's no way you're taking that top head off. Okay. And I've seen folk ask for that on a, an answer. All right, don't take the top head off. All right, just check. You can check on the from flipping the drum upside down and looking inside it to see if there's any damage to this top snare or the snare mechanism. Um, check for damages and then check functionality. Okay, so this is me doing the before we play. Check functionality. So you're making sure that when you play the drum that it sounds fine. All right, you'll be able to tap it and tell if it's burst. If something doesn't sound right or feel right, then try and figure out what it is. You're checking functionality of the drum in terms of sound and also appearance. If there's anything broke, as we said, damages. You'll be able to tell maybe by hearing it that something's broken that you couldn't see when you were checking for damages. Okay. Um, what I would usually do as well Lower the top snare. I always lower the top snare. And that for me also checks the functionality of the top snare. And when you strike the drum without the top snare on, you'll hear the functionality of the top head. And then once you've done that, put the top snare back up. So I'm gonna, I'll write um, raise top snare. And then do the same on the bottom. All right, loosen, slash, remove, bottom snare. And you're gonna check, once you've took that bottom snare off, you can check the bottom skin, and you can check the bottom snare. And then, same again, you're gonna put the bottom snare back on, as you said, or as we said before. Um, and, Oh, let me think. Once you've done that, I think in terms of before you've played, that's probably fine. And then after playing, let's put this here. So I'll write before up there and then after there. But I'll do it in a week once I've finished this because I want to send this to some folks. So after you've played, it's almost the same again. You're going to check for damages. Yeah, you check for damages on the drum, so the exact reverse of what you've done. All right, so up here you're checking for damages before you play. Check for damages after you've played. All right, check if anything's broke or damaged. All right, if you were performing in the rain, I'm going to write call out a water slash rain check. Okay. And you can elaborate on that quite a lot because with drums in the rain a lot of metal work can rust okay so you need to make sure that you get all that dried off because if you don't the drum's going to rust and um, the woodwork potentially if there's any cracks in the shell and water gets into that it could potentially warp your shell water get into the drum it's going to be a bit of a nightmare all right so you have to have to check all that um, and then make sure you've obviously dried off the drum Checked for damages. You don't have to check functionality. You can if you want. All right. Um, I'm going to write snares. Top and bottom. Because I always say to folk, loosen off your top and bottom snare. Just a touch. And certainly on the top height, lower the height a bit. And all that does is lets the snares relax a wee touch. So instead of them sitting at tension all the time, just loosen them off. And I find when you put them back on, it's almost like they've got a new lease of life. Okay. And then once I've done that, I'll check all the metal to metal parts. And again, you can elaborate on that because I'm checking that it's all dry, the metal parts to metal. And I'm also looking at 
any bolts, like tension bolts, um, that could potentially need lubricated again. Um, so I always try and make sure that they've got Vaseline on them. If they need re-lubricated, that's when you could do that. Um, and then that's me done in terms of the drum. Now we're going to look at what we do before we've, um, not before, but as soon as we've done all that, we're going to make sure that we store the drum. But when we store it, we're not going to put it next to our radiator because that's going to be insanely hot. Okay. Um, and metal and the heat causes it to expand so the drum will burst. Um, also on the same token, don't leave it outside or somewhere really cold because the drum's going the metal work will contract. Alright, so you don't want to do that either. We don't want anything that's going to cause the drum to burst. Okay, so remember store the drum in a cool and dry place. Um, I always air it first before I put it away in a case. Like once I've dried it out, I'll leave it for like an evening, possibly outside of the case. And that just lets it air. All right, so if there's any water, or, I mean, I'll have dried it, but if there's any loose bits of water that I've missed, that would be my chance to get, get rid of it by airing it out. Okay, and then you leave it until you need it next time. And at that point you would do all of these checks again. Okay, so for me, all of these little function the function points um points there you should get at least a hundred and fifty, but I reckon it'll be two fifty you'll be asked for. All right, and have a go at writing it out. I just don't want to write it out all just now because I don't want to give you a word for word answer. Okay, you would just follow all of these points and you'll get it. I'm pretty sure. So. To, look, uh, to cap it off, I don't know how long we were there, I explained everything, certainly I don't think I was anything near an hour, but I'll find out at the end. But if you've got any questions about anything that we've covered in the level 5 walkthrough, talkthrough, then give me a shout. Alright, quite happy to answer any questions you've got. Jeez, I don't know why I've given such big ears about anything here. I'm going to save this. All right, the video obviously I'll send to everyone, maybe put in the YouTube channel, but I'll save this document here, and if anyone wants a copy of it, I can send it to you, so just get in touch. Okay, so thanks again for watching. Make sure you practice all this, and look forward to our next video, which will be potentially a level 6 walkthrough.